Cool. All right. This is the Fellowship of the Link call for Wednesday, February 14th, 2024, Valentine's Day. Indeed, right. 14. Um, and yes, we were talking, I guess we did a checking and we talked about uh, Bahrain, mm -hmm. a visit by Jerry and the Tinderbox meetup uh, that Chris will attend. And next Monday, the free tourist brain call with a demo by Rich Borden. Beautiful. So, all very interesting stuff. And uh, I was going to say, I, I missed the last one, sorry. Uh, I almost missed two days, but, but I didn't. Uh, with uh, health issues. And um, I think you spoke about Neobooks. I don't know if uh, that's true. I think we did. What, did what, what all did we talk about? Let me go back to my notes. Uh, we talked about evaporative cooling of group mm -hmm. beliefs, autopoiesis. Autopoiesis? Oh, I love that. Uh, <laughs> it's like a she wallet, no? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the SA Warren's plazas, the edge of leg legibility. Yeah, that is last week. <clears throat> so here are my here are my um, notes from last week. There's a link in the chat. Oh, cool! So Thank you can you. see my note taking for it. And cool. if you want to put that in as a placeholder in the notes in the shared notes, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Cool. Um, um, school. So, and, uh, where where do you want to uh, take this? Um, so, so there was a. There, uh, let me report on something that Pete and I tried to do. Uh, so we have the NeoBooks calls on Mondays, and um, we're trying to sort of figure out what NeoBooks are and talk about NeoBooks, and we're doing oh. that here too. Um, and so, so that has been part of a big piece of our conversation here as well. And hey, Aram. Yeah. Yo, yo. Um, and one of the questions that Pete and I tried to bring into that call was about collective authoring. And I think last week I reported on that here as well. And what happened on the NeoBooks call was only Pete and I were really interested in this. And, and everybody else was like, let's figure out how to publish a book. Like, forget forget the, the funny details. But what Pete and I meant by collective authoring was, okay, if the nuggets of a neobook are meant to be alive and social documents and linky and all that good stuff, then what does social documents mean? Which kinds of technologies do we use for connection? And because we're using uh, markdown files on GitHub, the default form of social interaction is GitHub fork and pull or branching uh, and editing or other sorts of things, but those are very geeky forms of interaction. Then the, the follow-on questions are, what other forms of interaction might we want to add? And then how do we make them simple to understand and use? Because there's five different things you could do. You could add a discus chat uh, to a neobook, yeah, D-I-S-Q-U-S. Uh, you could add a forum like Discourse. You could add a Discord uh, you know, server. Uh, that's the place where conversations happen. You could add hypothesis links so that you could go talk on hypothesis. And that's not even sort of co-editing of pages, right? That those are all sort of comment systems. Um, so that, that was the opening of that. And we, I, don't, I don't know that we've resolved it well. I think what we have is kind of a, a little thorny, net, a thorny web of possibilities without a lot of clear thinking. My wishful thinking on this is that we could come up with some sort of trope that's easily remembered, like cut, copy, paste. Um, you know, early word processors, I was, I was using letter perfect on my Apple II plus, And then later my word, my word, my editor was the UCSD Pascal P system, which had its own little built in editor. Those were, those were my first word processors. And they, I don't think they had cut copy paste. I don't think that, uh, uh Tesla and others had done their magic at park to sort of, um, it's probably post park, but I don't, the Mac OS certainly didn't exist with cut copy paste. Um, but. Now everybody knows that if you look down on the keyboard, you see the X, the C, and the V, that those actually are power commands for doing cool stuff to move text around. Fabulous. Is there some analog for that for how to collaborate on a prose document? And what would that look like? Is it, is it an icon language? Is it just a, you know, how, how close? Do you just want to thumbs up or retweet or uh, reshare the nugget? Or do you want to offer changes to it? If so, what way, et cetera. I'll stop talking, but 
I hope that describes the conundrum. Interesting. So, I mean, I do have a few thoughts, some of which we maybe discussed before uh, on this. Uh, we covered this, a f uh, I think, a few times. Uh, we seem to like hit this wall of like, you know, uh, on the one hand, it makes sense to build a, a prototype that is, uh, you know, geared towards a particular like maybe more technical population according to some definition. But yeah, how to open that up later as well uh, to make it successful. So I remember. Um, we discussed, for example, like the, the even the notion of like sending a PR for um, or, or like actually merging changes of um, uh, text changes to notes or, or nuggets. Uh, you know, by default, if you get a Git conflict, you need to resolve the Git conflict, and that is sort of like it does require some skills sometimes, uh, but uh, because it's designed to be completely correct for source code, right? Which needs to be like you know, of course needs to parse. You don't want to introduce, you don't want to take any risk for that. For text, for human text, and in particular for, you know, like uh, nuggets, if you think uh, about this, you could imagine writing down the rules for how to merge nuggets. Uh, maybe, you know, if you add a new paragraph, maybe that uh, that can, uh, you know, uh, or, or, uh, or a new paragraph between two, or you add a, a new heading. You could imagine like listing all those and handling them so you don't need to request um, actual inter interaction from the user. So I think we discussed it before. Uh, the other thing, uh, just quickly, is that there are, I know there are systems built on top of Git and Markdown that add some interface on top, like, for example, um, uh, some wikis. There are several wikis, actually, which uh, have like uh, files on Git mm -hmm. as a backend. And I wonder if we could reuse, I, I mean, I, I'm not aware of one that does it great, but there's several I know. So maybe we could explore those and see, you know, how they actually make the editing easier and whether they do conflict resolution and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's what I have. Thank you. I'm trying to look up what are some wikis that use, that use uh, GitHub as their platform. Yeah, I will say Git. Uh, instead of a uh, git cover there to make yeah, that, that, more that makes more sense you're right yeah. you can use uh, you can check right here are some wikis built on git Gollum, docuwiki gitlab github so Gollum is one of them yeah uh, Gollum uh, rings a bell i don't know why i didn't use it when i was looking around yeah, well, I guess ended up, yeah but um uh, that, that's probably more popular hmm. Yeah, but I, I don't know, for example, if it uh, goes as far as supporting, like, you know, properly distributed editing, like, you know, forking a wiki, changing right. it and emerging. Yeah, I don't know. Anybody else thoughts? Uh, I mean, I think, like, there's a resource <laughs> reason why we end up at the Git model for a lot of these. Everything else requires like a lot of com compute intensive work in order to make this sort of model happen. Um, I think that's, that's why we end up with these particularly geeky ways to do this because the GitHub model is computationally inexpensive it does not require every participant have a server. It does not even require that every participant have a website. Um, I think like, while obviously a lot of us would like to push towards making sure that everybody has a website, in reality, that's not how a lot of people who may want to contribute work, or even the people who have a website may not consider it like the appropriate venue um, for this particular contribution so I, I don't know if that's really a solution per se but i do think it's sort of interesting to consider for um why we end up here mm -hmm. um i should add that google docs which lots and lots and lots and lots of people are familiar with has the standard ways of doing things one of which is you give people authorization to edit or comment or just view a document that's a sort of a trope that's pretty easy to understand 
And if you give somebody comment access only, then they can only, they can't affect the original text. And they, they, those changes have to be approved, which is sort of like fork and pull, um, except that I didn't, yeah. I didn't I never got to fork, uh, but I make yeah. I, I make suggestions to the text. Um, and then if you I mean, go, like hedge docs does that too, though, right? How? So in theory, we, we can collaboratively edit what the hedge doc we're looking at right now. Yes, but the same way you can but, with the Google. Thing. But there's no comments only mode. There is a everybody on a on a hedge doc is an is an editor, right? Uh, yeah. Because one of the so questions I think you can make a comment on it, right? There's a there's a framework for that. I don't know. Yeah, there is. Because one of the questions is, how, sometimes you want to protect the original text. You don't actually want anybody editing the original text. You just want to know what they think. And the, the, then there's lots of different ways to do that. Or having a list of who edited what, when, and where, which HedgeDoc does with color while you're in it, I think. Right. And I know Etherpad, if you save it as text somewhere else, yeah. all that data disappears. Right. And you don't yeah. have the like date time stamp changes as it goes along yeah but um etherpad actually well here we go i mean I, and and i think jerry you're spot on in like uh bringing up google logs because uh, i find myself also quite often saying like well if only we have a google logs mm -hmm. uh, of course part of my, in my daily life uh, very often that leads to well i just use a google talk uh, uh, but so you know that's that's one thing we could do, by the way. Like uh, Google Docs does have an API. Uh, you know the company that that uh, produces Google Docs, we can criticize it, but you know like we can still work with it. Yep. And uh, I actually have a to do for the hour, you know, to like say support Google Docs as a you know when you're in a node, you you should be able to say both create a Google Doc for this and attach it, or attach its existing Google Doc to this node. Right. But it shows up when you search for that now. Um, and potentially even the text gets imported. It, it shouldn't be too hard to uh, recurrently import from Google Docs. That's the easy part. Google Docs to I would, I would log to Massive Wiki. Because you know you can get the print version and then you just produce more. Mm -hmm. But like um the other way around, you know, like editing at a distance is of course like more sophisticated. And at that point, if you build that, I will agree that it would be nice to have Ideally, like a wrapper or something that says, you know, uh, okay, document with editing functions based on uh, CRDT or, you know, whatever, like, you know, the, these algorithms that make the concurrent editing work. And uh, and then we have sync, but that's, you know, quite sophisticated. Yeah. Um, and there's also, it, uh, what's, what's it yeah, called? Yeah. RDST? What's the acronym for? Oh, CRDT is. Uh, CRDT, right. CRDT, conflict-free replicated data type. Exactly, and yeah. and also um, what um, what Rich Burden has done with DXOS is Echo. He calls it Echo, and I think this is important enough to say here. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it might be really interesting. Let me just find it properly. Um, so DXOS has something called Echo, which is eventually consistent hierarchical object database. And I'll paste it in the chat. And that's another way of doing it. That's sort of a, 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 a I don't know if that uses CRDT or if it's a variant <clears throat> away from CRDT, and we can find out. <clears throat> Excuse me. But those are well known. Those, uh, well, uh, Echo is not, but CRDT is a well known way to do some of this. But again, that's if you're willing to let people have full access to the actual text of the document. Yeah, I mean, Yeah, I mean, the suggest mode is, is cool. So, OK, so uh, going back to Etherpad, in the case we want to keep it you know, open, mm -hmm. uh, it is the most user friendly I've seen in the category of like, you know, things you can edit concurrently. And it has the colors that actually stick, at least you know, more than uh, his talk. And people have built more stuff on it. But I always find myself disappointed that the, uh, we don't have like a more, more well-maintained Etherpad. Mm -hmm. like with the, but it for mm -hmm. sure has comments. Isn't isn't Hedgedoc and ha aren't Hedgedoc and Hackpad just uh, forks of Etherpad? No, Etherpad is an independent code. The way I understand it, Hedgedoc and HackMD, and 
one more of those these are all like forks of each other or they come from somewhere <laughs> like, uh, they oh, come it, was, it was originally called Cody MD Cody MD yeah oh they're they're all forks of sub ether edit oh uh, wait etherpad and hashlock actually share a lineage I do not know so I, I, no. I might be making this up but I think that hack MD is, def is definitely uh, comes from sub ether edit yeah, HackMD, I think it's, um, it comes from, we need like a yeah, lineage for open source. We need a little taxonomy yeah. here. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah and HackMD seems to be the most well supported, maybe. Yeah, but in any case, I uh, this is where um, I myself going back and forth between uh, say, okay, Etherpad and build the, the markdown support on it. You know, I, the, the original stuff for the hardware was Etherpad. It's still around if you hack it. And uh, HDoc is like, you know, um, yeah, Marlon native, but it loses a lot of the user friendliness. Uh, so you say Adam sub what? Sub uh, you said it. they all came from sub ETH or something? Yeah, I'll, I'll spell oh, it. What was second. that? Uh, let me paste yeah. in what uh, I just asked Google. So I, here's the name, sub -Etha edit. Sorry for all the text, and it also obliterated the bullet points that were in there and description, but it's sub -Etha edit. Interesting. Which is uh, been out there for a while. Uh, it comes from like... Um, oh, this guy. is an Apple-only app? Um, collaborative real-time editor designed for Mac OS. Interesting. Yeah. The name comes from the sub etha communication network in Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh -huh. <laughs> I did not know that. You know, Etherpad came from a separate. It's a different strand. It's a different strand. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Oh, yeah, it's inspired. Etherpad was apparently inspired by sub so etha edit. So yep. And so sub etha edit was originally called Hydra. Came out in 2003. Got renamed sub edit 2004. And Etherpad is 2008. So it feels to me like Etherpad was a different version of sub -Etha. It was sort of a competitor or uh, something else. I, there were a whole bunch of collaborative writing tools or source code editors that were coming out back then. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't, I, I think I've tangled in my head the lineage of these different things, but they offer a bunch of different capacities, right? Definitely. And, you know, this is where, regardless of what we want to achieve uh, and we, we tackle next, I mean, if we got, if, if, if we got like an, a, a great editor, or we, if we help the open source community converge, you know, like in some way, connect the people, etc., towards like something like Etherpad, but, but uh, maybe more maintained, because um, it's not. It's not getting as much development as I as it could. I think is my my, my perception. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be just like an uh, already like a great fit. Mm -hmm. uh, or if we found the one that is the the best fork. Essentially. Now, one of my problems with using HedgeDoc, HackMD, and all these things is that the URL to the HedgeDoc is never the URL to the permanently the, the permanently posted web page. It's a, it's a, it, it, HedgeDoc makes a temporary link that we collaborate in and then you go post it elsewhere, is my understanding. And that's a real problem for me because for me, like a Google Doc has a solid link, whatever it is, wherever it is, and that's just the link to the page. And when you know when Pete, Pete brings up, uh, uh, not HedgeDoc, but the other one a lot, we use all the time, HackMD. Yeah. And, and there's always an interim URL. Oh. Um... So I think like the URL you shared, I mean, we, we can always come back in and edit this, this, uh, this version of it, but if you wanted to make it look like a web page somewhere, uh, for, for other people who don't have permission to, on the document, I think it, that's a different URL, right? Uh, so I think you can share the view URL in that case, like this, which is a different URL. It's just the same, but it has like a query parameter says view. Huh? Fair. I mean, if we actually remove it, I think the default depends on the installation. Actually, the default is the view. Interesting. So yeah, loganagora.org slash free of the link just shows the render version. Okay. 
and I have a to do make the big links work here, of course, mm. uh, instead of just in the Agora. Cool. Yeah, but I, I think I, I went to the massive wiki call. I think they, they start a different nodes document for each call. Right. So and they use this uh, auto generate the URLs, but that, that's optional. I think if you don't give it a, a URL, like a slug, it will generate one for you. And this is a neighboring topic that's really interesting to me is like, uh, how do you do agendas and note taking so that, and what you do, which I like a lot, is one long continuous document. And you just add the new call to the top of the document and we go from there. Um, and one of the problems of group dynamics is that we often don't have a memory. We don't remember what we agreed to last time. We create a new, it's like every conversation is a blank starting from yeah. fresh. Yeah. And then one of the things that I, I like about note taking in the brain is that instead of having one long document, which I will point to as the meeting notes, I'm busy deconstructing or decomposing everything into the different things we mentioned and statements we made and things like that. That's how I note take in the brain. So, so I would preserve a link to the perma notes for that call, but then I'm busy doing notes in a different way, which is more granular, smaller than even having a separate page for the day, or one day's, one call's notes. Uh, and, and to me is, is the weaving part, because when you do notes on a page, there's a whole mess of different things that are captured on one document, which is only useful to the people who are in that call. Right. So. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. This is where like um, I use it, the, this push concept mm -hmm. for this, for the idea of like essentially cross-posting to different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, it, it will once if you if we agree to keep into Git or mark on Git and so on as a lingua franca uh, or a platform. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to tackle the, the problem of uh, I guess denormalization. Mm -hmm. That's what you see, the term you use in, at least in databases, you know, like um, where, you know, you move from the strictly like minimum uh, sufficient model, which is, you know, for example, in this case, you pick, you take a note in a particular place mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the data is in one place to a, play, to a, a model in which it fans out and you make as many copies as you need to make. So the data is everywhere. Mm -hmm. So this is where it could also go back to the uh, collaboration question. So, you know, like Jerry, you take a note in your brain and ideally uh, that will cross post, right? In right. some way to maybe even your obsidian. You could get like, you can imagine like your obsidian ball getting like a text only dump or whatever you, whichever notes you took uh, on a particular day, for example. Mm -hmm. you know? So that, that would be like the normalization from in, in, under this lens. Yeah, and we've talked a bit about pose and posse and poses, the different different architectures for where to post and all that, which is I find really interesting. I, I don't know if we've solved those problems, but uh, Chris, I think you have an explicit uh, strategy on that. I don't know if I have one that works specifically for this book. Yeah, no, I just mean in, in the in the way that you post online. I don't, never mind the neobooks uh, context at all. Yeah, but I, I think you uh, you have explicitly um, sort of chosen an architecture for this for yourself, right? Yeah, or at least in places where it where it works easiest, and I can get data back. I use Posse, which is post to my own site and syndicate out. Um, and then there are a few cases where, I, and usually I do that when I know I can get data back from comments on things, mm -hmm. um, which usually works pretty well. Um, in some places where syndicating out isn't easy, and particularly things like you know Facebook and Twitter have turned off their APIs for doing that. Sometimes I'll either do it manually or use RSS feeds or other methods, and I'll, I may post somewhere else, but knowing that my system will suck that data in and create, usually it creates a private post mm -hmm. on my own site, so I at least keep the data. And oftentimes in those cases, I don't get any of the commentary back unless I do it manually. And usually I'll do that if and only if it's something that really actively adds to the conversation. Um, uh, and even on that front, 
Uh, he announced it this week, but Ryan Barrett is bridging across um, the Activity Pub protocol with the AT protocol that Blue Sky is doing. And of course, everybody have exploded like, oh, hey, I, I think the big issue was he said, I'm making it opt, opt out if you want to opt out of it. And everybody freaked out, like, "Oh, it should be a opt, opt, you know, it should be opt in only." Um, but I think most of those people lost the fact that almost the entirety of the Fediverse is, you know, you, you federate automatically, and then anyone can see or read your stuff unless you block them, which is what happens typically with. The Nazis and the crazies and the weirdos, you actively go out of your way with a list and say, I don't want to see that stuff. I'm blocking these people. Um, but uh, so a lot of people freaked out thinking, oh, for privacy's sake, it should be, I should opt into this. When in fact, that really, that's not how the internet generally works. Um, and I think I, I, everybody looked at it as uh, an individual piece, like, I have to specifically go in and know this thing exists and opt out of it, which is not the case. Usually it's going to be your administrator at the, you know, your server level, who's going to make those decisions for you and who generally does make those decisions for you. You just don't know about it. Um, so, yeah. um, it's in social call just yesterday, by the way. Yeah. I, mean, I, I saw a bunch of, I've seen a bunch of people and I've watched Ryan Barrett's work for the better part of a decade. And he's done these bridging projects with Facebook and Twitter and all kinds of other things that are way nastier than anything you could expect from Blue Sky currently. Um, and he's done it very well and very successfully without horrible harm. But I think he's actually doing more good kind of for the free and open internet to create this adversarial interoperability, whether some of these companies want it or not, which brings the walls down in general. So uh, I, I agree so much, Chris, like I, <laughs> and I had these conversations within the co-op even uh, a few times with uh, the bridges in general, they are seen as, uh, they, they are factions here. It's like people uh, are quite polarized, even we have social co-op and I think that's presented all the favors. Uh, from you know like and and of course like it happens in these cases each band to put it some way is quite convinced of the position right um that and that like, it should be the default essentially like opting or out uh, and yeah i've gotten uh, a lot of requests from like people uh, i've seen threads saying like we should defederate preemptively from this from that and we should be uh, ban bots if something's a bot it should be out and like uh, crawling in general, you know, like I think we discussed before, uh, just the notion of crawling like a, a master instance, for some instances, it, it, it is, um, they feel it is, um, yeah, um, a violation of pri pri privacy, uh, even though it is indeed how the internet works, uh, uh, which is uh, usually um, what I try to say. But of course, uh, um, I understand that, you know, I am quite privileged and not, I haven't been the victim of a dog thing, I haven't been the victim of a harassment. So, of course, there's people who need better controls, right, oh, on visibility. Um, yeah, and, and what happened in social COVID is that uh, uh, the admin that was on call just went um, went uh, and, and banned the, uh, like, um, uh, Ryan Barrett's um, uh, bridge, uh, just, just preemptively. Well, the, uh, before the, com the, the, the community discussed it. Yeah. And we're going to be out. It may be the right call for the community, by the way. I'm not saying that I'm it wrong, but it, I, I will have done that. So, you know, this is where, like, even within the same admin group, in a, in a single instance, you will have, like, a, a, a wildly different uh, defaults. And I don't know if you can read this. Maybe not. This Lumio thread.
Ja. So, uh, what are you draw uh, from these? Oh, interesting. Thank you for the links. Yeah, I don't know. I think. Um, sorry, I was reading them, so I got sort of distracted. Uh, it is really interesting stuff, like the idea of what is bridging, how do things broadcast back and forth. I don't know. I. I, I wish that there were, and we've talked about this, I wish there were different models than what we've got for Federation um, and for like Indie Pub, where there's this question of like, do we bridge everything? Do we become broadcasters? I feel like there's a, a missing piece that's like we're very focused on becoming broadcasters and less focused on becoming collectors. I think that's oh. I don't know. Oh. I think like that's one of the problems I have with like this question of like the various bridges of activity pub. Like I don't know. I don't know. It just I it's also the problem I have with like the with the bridgey stuff. One of the problems I have with the bridgey stuff as well. I, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a, it, the, the tough part, I think, really is the how do you map, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of human social evolution into an internet space and do it in a way that fits where where we were or create sets of expectations of who you're going to run into, what that community looks like and how it works. And I think a lot of the issue is, hey, something new shows up that may look scary. And this week it was this potential bridge to blue sky and everybody freaks out because they don't know. I'm not, maybe I'm not on blue sky and I don't, I don't want to federate with them. Although, I, you know, I broadly, I haven't heard anybody jumping up and down and saying blue sky is a horrible place the way, you know, me, we, or, you know, Trump's social media service were, you know, three in the last three, four or five years where like, yes, you expect the majority of people there to not be people you may want to interact with. So you're worried about incoming spam or crap, mm -hmm. but how do you, and I just this past week, I finished reading um, Corey Doctorow's The Internet Con, where he, you know, broadly makes as he always has. And it, it, for me, his the book was a lot of rehashing of the last 10, 15 years of internet history from his perspective and he broadly takes the stance that, yes, we should have small federated communities that are able to make their own choices. The same way you you make a choice of which city or town you're going to live in, and you have to negotiate how to interact with the people you run into at the store, or the church, or school, or wherever you're going. And there are usually methods in that real world space when someone is horrible to either throw them beyond the pale or if they're doing terrible, terrible things, you arrest them and you put them in jail and you segregate them away from the city. That's what mm -hmm. But we don't have those methods of operation in, in internet space, or at least mm -hmm. not easily done or well done. Um, you know, you, so you get thrown out of Facebook or Twitter, you move somewhere else and you just keep make, creating the same problems. Um, like, you know, unless you're like, do something so horribly bad, a judge says you can't be online at all, uh, which, you know, very rarely happens. Um, so those, th those types of things are hard. And when new things pop up, it's super hard to know what the social norms are or should be around whatever that new thing is. Yeah. 
Um, and you know, uh, when I discuss these things uh, with people in, in the instance, you know, it's a medium sized instance, like uh, 2,000 people um, active, I think. And, you know, I, I see this fee, these two, um, you know, bands emerge, like uh, one or two, but mostly two. Um, I cannot help but think it, it, it has to do with how people uh, are gauging the risk and benefit um, uh, of like connecting with others. Um, and, and it goes back, and this is why, you know, the polarization is not even surprising. It, it, to me, it, it could map to the political spectrum, you know, but it actually doesn't because, you know, like in this instance, we are like, you know, it's mostly like left wing and so on. So, you know, this is not that, uh, but it is some degree of conservatism versus liberalism to put it, to use two words. Uh, uh, that we know, uh, maybe there's better words, but you know, like uh, there's a the person who is prioritizing, you know, not meeting the person they really don't want to meet, who maybe in this, you know, network instance, etc. Uh, and that would be the conservative in this in this framing, versus the person who is prioritizing, you know, meeting all the people they uh, they want to meet that they could meet. So the person who wants to not cut the, the, the person who wants to cut uh, uh, links by default early and the person who were rather not. And this is where I, I think that blue sky actually has a, a lot of potential, right? Because it's sort of like decoupling, it seems, as I understand it, the um, the community or, or group that, uh, you know, runs the base infrastructure from the moderation decisions and the algorithms and so on, no? So then, you know, what I see in social code, which is like how the instance wants to ban threads, wants to ban blue sky, relatively. I have the instance doesn't want to. That seems like it seems like Blue Sky may be the answer to that the solution. It's like okay, we can run an instance that has many groups with different preferences and leave it up to them essentially, instead of having to say uh, eventually you know you adopt one policy and you're saying to the have the instance, well maybe there's an instance that is better for you and you need to move. Well, I, part of that presumes too that you're on an instance for as a broadcast set of interests so you know big platforms like twitter and facebook tend to be you know i i post to them and twitter is probably a better example because it's i can post anything to it and everything or when i did syndicate to it i syndicated pretty much everything as a default because that's how people use twitter mm -hmm. but when i go to reddit i don't broadcast everything to the entirety of reddit i look at very niche things like you know there's a group that really only talks about zettelcast and, and if i put political messages into that channel you know somebody's going to ban me pretty quickly because we just we don't talk about that here so it becomes a smaller very niche space of or like, you know, I we had that link earlier in the chat to the a Tinderbox forum. You would expect that only Tinderboxy related stuff is gonna pop up there. So that when you're there, that's all you're ever gonna see. Unless if you see a political mm -hmm. message, it would be, oh, oh, hey, did you hear, you know, Joe Biden is using Tinderbox now and that's how he's running his administration. Okay, I oh, get yeah. that. You, you have that discussion and you move on and then usually the politics or the religion or all the other stuff is pulled out of it um so there are fediver spaces where i have you know there's one small community that's all academics talking mostly about their academic work and for me that's great because i i know what to see and expect there occasionally there's some political stuff pops up but generally it stays pretty low key. So right, I don't but, have to worry about but it. But what do you do if uh you know that community is like we will ban blue sky? I, I wouldn't worry because I have other ways to access it right. in my sense. But since I publish everything on my own website, only a small fraction or a subset of what I publish, do I click a checkbox and say yes, send it to that little Fediverse instance of all the academics? and kind of go from there but i get to pick and choose but the the issue that then creates more work on me as a user is i have to know what's happening in those and you can call them publics they're small little publics of space 
what's happening in that space and do I syndicate a message into it knowing in advance how it may or may not be received? And so when I think of social media, I think of it more as small little niche neighborhoody places. Is this does this thing I'm writing, does it need to be in that space? Is anybody gonna care? And if I don't think they will, I either won't send it there or if I do, I'll ping somebody specifically, hey, you might be interested in this thing, rather than I, you know, I'm not the New York Times. I'm not, everything I say is not going to be broadly interesting to everyone. But sadly, that's how the majority of social media users use social media is they think everybody's going to be interested in what I have to say. And almost no one is. Mm -hmm. a, so, bunch you know, of, a bunch of what you were just saying is about a sort of group boundaries. And I, I love all that stuff. And also a, a, a well-functioning group understands its boundaries and its norms. And, and those two things are key for group dynamics. Sorry, um, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if that's true, right? People post, sorry, not what you were saying, Jerry, but what you were saying earlier, Chris. I don't know if it's true that like it, people necessarily are posting to social media on the assumption that it's for everyone. I think I think the way most people use social media, and we see it when people go unexpectedly viral, right, is that people post to social media thinking it's their small neighborhood. And they hope that people who want to be in that neighborhood will find it. And then disaster occurs when the the norms of the small neighborhood that they weren't ever really on was were was breached. It was why like circles made so much sense on Twitter. Um in the sense that like you could define the neighborhood and the neighborhood could be this suggested to people, but you could but you could still live within the defined limits of that neighborhood. And um and have it not accidentally go viral in a way that, you know, you make a joke that thinking you make, you see it like people make a joke on Twitter, right? And the joke's context is their small group, but that joke isn't funny outside of that small group. It gets misinterpreted. It goes viral, right? That That's the classic problem of social media. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I don't know how... <laughs> How much I could derive from that in terms of next steps, but yeah. Really, currents only died in 2022. Interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe the two one, but no, I think it's what's in the two years. And the interestingly, the my original path was use chat. So I guess you know whoever made a decision thinks. Um, Slack to core, essentially having the Slack model to put some way. Which uh, uh, to, to the conversation, uh, it is very much about like having more a control neighborhood. You, you don't have Slack virality, as I understand it, you know. Um, yeah, I, you know, I take your point, um, but I always approached Twitter as the, the, you know, the public square from which everyone stood and yelled and whether they got any attention or not was another thing but yes you're right there are people who who don't know that it's the public square that they're having their you know cia meeting in and that anybody can overhear it and do whatever they want with it um which then yeah. freaks everyone out because they didn't have that expectation um and I get I part of it may be how you tend to approach your social media platform of choice, what what you think the rules are versus what they actually are. And how you relate to the surprise, no? Because uh, here I go back. Uh, maybe this is just my headship like this today, but I can imagine, you know, for example, I think I, if any of my posts went viral, I would be delighted. I would just really, I mean. When that has happened, and not very often, I'm like, great, 
this was like I, I don't see drawback to that. Of course, you know, I've been lucky maybe with what happened after that, but um, and other people will be horrified, right? And I think that's this, uh, you know, uh, a lot of these platforms, like um, uh, social platforms, are sort of like sweeping this under the rug, maybe. It's like maybe they don't want users to think too hard about, you know, all the edge cases. Um, yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was finished. I was going to say, I think you've hit it right. Like the thing is, you know, people like us on this call, we understand that the, that public means public. Right. But right. most people, when they are on a public square in real life, have conversations with each other. I'd assume that no one will dip in and intentionally misinterpret them and start an argument with them, right? We're just standing on the corner of a literal public square. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most social media outlets depend on the small number of people who understand that the intent is to broadcast and also depend on the majority of users who come in with the assumption that they are not being broadcast. Um, right. The, it's the old Twitter thing, right? Like every day Twitter has a main character and you hope to God you're not it. Right. Mm -hmm. But Twitter wouldn't work without it having a main character. That's mm -hmm. what makes right. Twitter interesting to most people who participate on there. Um, and most people who participate on there don't think about the fact that they could become the main character. Not really. Um, that should be a setting, maybe, right? The friction, right? What's that? That should be a setting, maybe. Like, I want to be the main character, or I would rather uh, be in the background. And it's completely right. fine. Maybe it depends on the day. Right, but the minute you ask someone that question, they become aware of the problem. Exactly. And Twitter is very dependent on the majority of users not being aware that that's the problem. Yeah. Well, but there's also the case, too, of people who are in social media only to consume. You know, my wife puts out no content whatsoever, but consumes a couple hours a day of watching either the character of the day or the thing of the day or the comedy or the joke. And they also rely on that a lot. So you don't have to worry about the harms other than the harms of your algorithm showing them something that's going to offend them so horribly they're going to leave altogether. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a huge amount of social media space that just totally gets ignored because you don't see it, you don't know it's there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that, like, though social media platforms have an advantage from those types of users, that's not the desired user profile for a social media platform. It's the, it's the friction of capitalism in the system, right? You need producers, you need people who are willing to produce for free, and you need people to go viral because that is in how you engage people on there that then make ad impressions. Uh, people who do not produce on a social media platform are required for the platform to function and succeed, but they are not the desired profile of users, and therefore no platform ever caters to them. Well, other just than to like, send them ads. Right, right, other than to send them ads, but that's that's but they're not being catered to. The platform's not being yeah. built for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or or it's being built at a very low level to make it easy for them to consume and consume and consume. Right, right. Right, the TikTok model. But I, I don't think Twitter and TikTok are the same model. Yeah, I know. Yeah, not at all. And that's the problem, too, is when you're a member of 57 different social media platforms, the amount of extra overhead knowledge you have to carry, not only about how each of them works, but who's on them and who you're interacting with which just creates more and more levels of, you know, social, you know, and if, if your Dunbar number really is 150, how many people can you honestly keep up with and know all the social relationships and, you know, that, and that's a amount of work, you know, 
So it's a whole lot easier for me to sit in a call like this and have this be my social media for today, where I only have to keep up with four or five, six people and in their specific contexts versus, hey, I go to Twitter and it's just overwhelming because there's so much going by. Well, um, a big piece of why OGM exists is my frustration with us drowning in the information torrent so that there's too many things floating by in the stream and we don't have any place to put them or share them with each other. And the sharing them with each other part has a lot to do with the intimacy gradient kind of conversation that we're having here about who you expect to be able to read your posts. And the intimacy gradient is this lovely pattern that says there are certain people you'd expect to meet in your bedroom, your living room, your block party, and the, 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 the city bus station. And, and your assumptions about security and privacy and all that other kind of stuff vary by where you are in the intimacy gradient. Uh, and so how we haven't figured our way out through this very much. I was just, I, I've, I've been finding a whole bunch of old um, presentations I gave. And I used to use a diagram where I talked about how before the internet shows up, we have two extremes of communication topology. One-to-one, -one, the phone call and broadcast, which is magazines, TV, radio. That's it. There's sort of nothing in between, not a lot in between. And all of a sudden, the internet allows all these different topologies to show up, where Twitter is weird because Twitter can feel like an intimate conversation between two people that happens to be overheard by millions, right? Twitter is very interesting that way because you can do something that's, that's very personal, but, it, but it's actually out in the public view. And we haven't comfortably figured out what the taxonomies or signal or sem uh, se semiotics are uh, for all those different kinds of spaces. And newbies trip along and they don't realize what's going on. And then children growing up now realize that one of their private little posts, and, and God hope that they realize that any one of their private little things could go viral and suddenly be the, 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 the you know the, the Twitter person you don't want to be that day, uh, or TikTok or what have you. And, and, and so just since the internet, so since 95, let's call it, we have this enormous exploding richness of ways of communicating, and we haven't figured out really how to do it. So again, my question at the top of this call about collaboration architectures or whatever you want to call it, like how do we help people collaborate on words, uh, which includes just hitting the thumbs up button and liking a post. That's a, that's a form of collaboration on words. Um, how do we make that better is, is a piece of this. I, I, I uh, completely agree, Jerry, and, and I guess we are almost out of time, but like uh, something I, I wanted to bring up is the, the notion of maybe decoupling the terms of service, to put it some way, or the contracts that we follow in social media, essentially, uh, you know, the expectations, the making public of our expectations, decoupling those from the platforms, you know, to some extent, uh, uh, when you sign up for Twitter, like we were saying, the issue is that you're accepting to a uh, something, uh, to a contract that is seems surprising to many, right? It's super surprising to many, and uh, uh, that may not represent you. And you know, we only, you only have the video, and, and you know, I know which is quite insufficient to say this is how I hold this tool, which is just, to some extent is like you know the internet, like you say, it's like the, the, the whole potential of the internet with all the gradients. And like I, I've dreamt a few times of like being able to say, you know, this is how I use this platform and this platform and this platform uh, in a way that is universally readable, maybe, right? Um, and that actually results in maybe different uh, defaults kicking in, right? If, um, and it goes goes to the opt-in model, maybe or opt-out, where like, uh, and what we discuss about platforms, maybe not wanting to expose these settings or support them. Uh, but you know, maybe we should roll our own. Mm -hmm. Well, even historically, there has been shifts in how various media reacted to various things. So, you know, in the early '60s, magazines and newspapers had a, you know, essentially a quiet agreement amongst each other. You know, JFK is the president, but we're not going to talk about his affairs in public because that's a private thing for him. Or Roosevelt's, and, Roosevelt's wheelchair. 
you know, or yeah, and then you move forward several years, and suddenly it's oh, we we don't care because we want to sell more papers, so we're going to put Monica Lewinsky, a tiny private 